And joining us now is Leon Panetta, the former Defense Secretary, CIA Director, and former White House Chief of Staff, among other many posts in government. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, how dangerous is this growing relationship between Xi and Putin? Uh, what are the global implications, or do you think that Xi is not going to cross a line, that he does not want to trigger sanctions at a time when he needs to prop up his economy? And, uh, needs those European and U.S. markets. Well, you know, I think it's clear from this meeting that, uh, you know, there are there are really three areas uh, that uh, that need to be focused on. One is that, in many ways, this meeting, the summit meeting between Russia and China, kind of defines what the world looks like in the 21st century, in the sense that uh, the autocrats of the world, uh, Russia, China. North Korea, Iran, uh, represent uh, one group of, uh, of countries uh, in the world of the 21st century, and the United States and our allies uh, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, the democracies of the world represent, uh, you know, the other a group of uh, important countries uh, in the world. Uh, there's no question. Uh, the second thing is that uh, China represents the strongest partner here. Putin has been weakened. Uh, by these war crimes, by his uh, loss of the uh, war in uh, Ukraine, uh, the fact that uh, his force has been depleted, the impact on Russia. So there's no question that he is the lesser uh, in this partnership and that she obviously is the stronger partner. Uh, but thirdly, then it puts a, a bigger responsibility on Xi, because for China to remain the strongest partner, they have to have a strong economy. And so what I sense here is that China has to play this balancing role, saying that on one hand, they're a peacemaker and trying to provide peace uh, in the Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, that makes clear that they really can't provide uh, military arms to the Russians because that would undermine their peacemaker role. Uh, and uh, secondly, they're concerned that the world would impose sanctions on China, which could hurt their economy. So uh, while all of this is taking place, it's pretty clear that China is now caught in a balancing act uh, where it's not clear just exactly what will result from what she is doing. And what she is doing, though, uh, he does represent the global south, which in terms of population is bigger than the U.S. and Europe combined. Of course, he's making inroads in Africa, in Central America as well, Latin America. But at the same time, uh, in this balancing act, his interest is in prolonging the war, is it not? Because he does not want Russia to lose. He doesn't want the other major autocracy to lose against the United States. But he's not so sure he wants Russia to win. No, that I think that's right. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's, uh, that's part of the dilemma uh, confronting Xi, uh, because uh, he, he knows uh, that uh, very frankly, if uh, if Putin should succeed, uh, then it could uh, represent a very different kind of world. It would put more pressure on China to go after Taiwan. Uh, it would interfere with China's effort to try to move towards global leadership uh, in replacing the United States. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think uh, she understands that uh, it is critical right now that uh, he, he appeared to support Putin in this effort just to give Putin some leverage. Because, frankly, right now, the chances are that Zelensky has most of the leverage, that if they initiate some kind of offensive uh, in the Ukraine, they could continue to push the Russians back and put more pressure on Putin to either withdraw or ultimately negotiate. So I think we are at a pivotal point in this war in terms of where we go next. Uh, if Zelensky is successful, if he can put more leverage on Putin, uh, yes, China can play this peacemaker role, but in the end, it's going to be Zelensky that will determine the terms of any kind of peace. Let me talk to you about the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, and a decision to accelerate the delivery of Abrams tanks. Uh, we've seen this pattern where the U.S. is reluctant to go along with tanks, reluctant to, now to go along with F-16s, and argues that 
the Abrams tanks were too complicated for the Ukrainians to manage, and now they're supposedly going to try to deliver them by fall. Uh, is this a pattern, and should they just do the F-16s now as well? Well, we've been, we, we've been through this pattern uh, for a while, where uh, there's obviously, uh, you know, resistance to providing weapons, and then ultimately uh, the United States moves forward uh, to provide these sophisticated weapons. Uh, I think we need to provide uh, these weapons to the Ukrainians. This is a critical time right now. Uh, and providing them the Abrams tanks uh, just means that, you know, we are able to train them and to give them the capability that would be very important in a maneuverable war in which you, you're basically a land-based kind of uh, operation against the Russians. It would give them tremendous support. I think the same thing is true for fighter planes. I'm glad that Poland is providing fighter planes. I think we should also seriously consider providing uh, F-16s and training pilots. It's going to take a while, but we ought to make the decision to proceed with that. We ought to give them the weapons they need in order to be able to initiate an offensive against the Russians. That's the best way, the best way to reply to this meeting between Xi and Putin is to show that Ukraine still has the advantage and still is winning the war uh, that is so important to democracies in the world.